And we finally get to talk about mass analyzers. So let's uh, start with the beginning and uh, talk about magnetic sectors. Actually, let's talk about the electric sectors first. So very simple. You have two plates here and an ion that's placed right in the middle of it. Now, nothing's going to move until you place it in an electric field. But as soon as you do, it's just a matter of positive attracting to negative. Kind of obvious, right? So just to make sure we're on the same page, you got your field strength here, which is proportional to the volts and the distance, okay? So it's like how much voltage it goes through per centimeter. So that's the units we're dealing with. So let's use this setup to our advantage and create an ion source. Our goal is to just push the ions out that way. So you put a hole on one side of the plate, the voltage is off, but as soon as you turn it on, it accelerates the ions until it gets outside of this system. And we can actually equate the kinetic energy of the ions. So 1 half mv squared is related to the volts times the charge E. So we're not talking about Z anymore. It's actually the elemental charge, but you think it's kind of one and the same. So check out this configuration here, same voltage system. You turn the volts on, the ion just kind of heads uphill. It just keeps going and going. It's sort of never going to stop, right? So let's just put something in the way. We'll put a curved plate and we're going to apply a voltage to the top plate. So that means there's going to be a force applied kind of pushing down, right? So as the ions move through that field, they're going to feel that force. So the trajectory won't be straight anymore. It'll curve it down. So let's think about all the forces at play here. First, we have the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared. That's related to that initial plate, the V over here. So because that charged ion is moving in this electric field, we're going to have a force pushing down on it as well. And remember that electric field is volts per centimeter. So there is one more force here. Because the ion is being forced through a curved path, we have a centripetal force as well. It's kind of Newton's law, right? So you've got forces coming up and force going down. The centripetal force is mv squared over r. So according to Newton's law, because the ion isn't accelerating up or down, these two forces are going to be equal to one another. So there's the math that you see right here. Or we can say that the radius of curvature depends on the voltage that you're kicking the ions out, as well as the voltage of the electric field going down. So let's look at these different scenarios here. Let's say we've got an ion and it's accelerating extremely fast. What's going to happen to it? Well, it's going to be moving too quickly to curve it down through this path. So it's going to strike the top plate. Likewise, if you have an ion that's too low in energy, so if we're applying too little voltage, it'll curve too strongly and it'll hit the bottom of the plate before it gets out of this electric sector. And of course, there's a point on the kinetic energy curve where it's going to be just right. And the ion can bend with a radius that just allows it to make it through to the other side without hitting the plates. Now, I should point out that this is not a mass spectrometer. So a mass spectrometer we know separates ions according to mass to charge. So I have a bunch of different ions here, different mass to charge, but they're all being accelerated with the same voltage. They have the same kinetic energy nothing changes. They all move at exactly the same path. So what is this good to us? Well, certainly it's not good as a mass spectrometer. It isn't a true mass analyzer, as we would say, but we can put this to use in other ways. And this is going to become important with pretty much every type of mass analyzer we talk about in this class. And it has to do with the fact that ions are never totally sitting at rest. I mean, they're not at absolute zero. So this Boltzmann distribution curve is basically describing that some ions are higher in energy, some of them are lower in energy. So there's going to be a distribution. Or we can look at it like this. Now, right now, there's no electric field applied, the voltage is off, and yet the ions are just drifting apart because they're moving on their own accord. So you get to the point where they've sort of spread out in the system. You see some ions have moved this way, some ions have moved in the other way. Now if we turn on the voltage, everything's going to be kicked out with a high electric field. So there's going to be a, a massive amount of kinetic energy compared to what they had to begin with. But the two will still add together. So this is the energy that's applied by the mass spectrometer, And then the initial energy of the ion. These are vectors, so they add together. Of course, if the ion is in the other direction, then it takes away some of the total energy of the ions. So no matter what, all of the ions are going to have slightly more or slightly less energy. So let's look at it now. Here's a bunch of ions. Let's just say that they all have the same m over z, but they have that Boltzmann distribution. So some of the ions already have a little bit of energy. That means 
the ones with too much energy are going to be forced a little bit on the high end. They'll strike the top of the plate. And of course, the other half of the population, or not half, but many of them, are going to be too low in energy, so they're going to curve too much. Only those ions that are in this sort of middle ground are able to get through the sector. So in summary, an electric sector is simply a kinetic energy separator. You can pick ions according to a specific kinetic energy. Okay, let's put that on pause. We'll go back to the magnetic sector now. So we got a magnetic field and an ion, a charged particle, is moving down through that electric field. Now, where's the forces? What's, what's going on here? What's moving? So we use the letter B to symbolize the magnetic force. And when we're talking about magnetism and charged particles and electric field and where the forces are, we're dealing with the right hand rule. Okay, so your finger's pointing out with the, the direction of the magnetic field, the electric field is pointing downwards, and then the force is in this sort of pointing out direction. So let's apply it to the system that we have right here. So if we have the magnetic field pointing across this way, and our ions are moving down through it, then the force that's applied is actually pushing out towards you. So the ions are bending but coming out into the screen each time. A little hard to draw it, but you know what I mean, right? So I know that orientation is a little bit weird. It's not traditional the way we think of a magnetic sector. So I'm gonna draw it now where the magnetic field is actually pointing towards you, okay? So it's pushing outwards. And that's gonna make things easier because now we're gonna see that the force is going to be pushing downwards, okay? So we have our curved magnetic field. It's pushing the ions as you see over here. So once again, let's talk about the forces at play. Again, that voltage from the ion source applies kinetic energy to our ion, one half mv squared. Now again, the centripetal force is pointing upwards because the ion's curving down. Now when we talk about the force of the ion that's being pushed by the magnetic field, it depends on the field strength, the ion's charge, but also on its velocity. So B times E times V. So again, we are equating the equations of the, the force moving up and the force pushing down, and you get what you see over here. mv squared over r is proportional to b times e times v, the velocity. So you do a little bit of rearranging, and what you get in the equation is an mv term. So mv represents momentum. And in other words, we're not dealing with a mass spectrometer again. A magnetic sector, believe it or not, is not a mass spectrometer. Well, okay, it is. It just doesn't separate ions strictly according to m over z. This momentum term, the velocity, comes into effect. So when you rearrange the equation, you see m over e, m over z, pretty much the same thing, it is related to the magnetic field strength, to the radius of curvature, as well as the voltage that we're using to accelerate the ions outside of this sector. So we have three different ions here. They're three different sizes, but if they are moving with the same velocity, then they have three different momentums as well. And they're gonna curve where the high momentum hits the top plate, the one with too low momentum hits the bottom, and the one that's just right goes in the middle. If we can say that the velocity is constant, then this whole system is basically separating ions according to their m over z. And in this setup over here, we have a fixed magnetic field, we have a fixed radius, so you get these ions to curve like that. So how do you make this work as a mass spectrometer? Well, you have to change something. So change the magnetic field strength. These are electromagnets, so you can just increase the voltage on the magnet and basically you get a higher field strength. You could also change the voltage that you're kicking out here. And technically you can change the radius as well, although that's kind of an old school system that we're simultaneously detecting all compounds at the same time. Go back to like the first set of slides. I showed you those early mass spectrometers that had different radius of curvatures. So here's just an example of changing the magnitude of the magnetic field and the ions will move where basically only the biggest one can make its way through and then the smaller ones back their way up. So let's come back to that electrostatic sector. So what was the point of that? Well, you can kind of see how they might come together and, and they literally do come together. You can combine an electrostatic sector, which separates on kinetic energy, and the magnetic sector, which separates on momentum. And if you do it just right, in just the right geometry, you can make the distribution kind of cancel itself out. So let's just take a look. Let's say we have two ions here. I'm saying one is hot, one is cold. In other words, extra energy and then lower energy. 
So if the ion has extra energy, it's going to bend a little on the high side. The one with less energy bends on the low side. What that means is that they're going to actually enter the magnetic sector at slightly different points. Now these ions, we're going to say, have the same mass, but they do have different velocities at this point. So they have different momentum. That would mean that they would separate, but I don't want them to. They're the same mass. So because they've entered the magnetic sector at a slightly different point, they're actually focused back to the same point, which is what we want. These ions have the same mass to charge, not the same momentum. But the electrostatic sector has allowed us to bring these curves back together. So the ions will focus exactly in one spot. Now what you're seeing there is just one example of the different orientations that you can have. And these combinations of magnetic and electrostatic sector, they create very large machines, like the types of mass spectrometers that literally fill up a room. But the goal behind them is to just allow you to improve the focus of the ions. Improving the focus is another way of saying improving the resolution. So a traditional magnetic sector just by itself doesn't give you good resolution at all. However, when you combine them in this way, you can get an extremely high resolution mass analyzer. This was pretty much the only way of doing high resolution mass spec in the earlier days until newer instrumentation came out. That's what we're going to be talking about in the later videos. So stick around.